what I would like to do in our uh, time tonight is to um, chat about uh, what I've called Revolutionary Ulster uh, between about 1770 and 1800. And what I want to try to do is to give you a, a sense of the, the big developments, big political developments in particular that affected Ireland in the latter part of the 18th century and were especially important in the province of uh, Ulster. And I want to, uh, to talk about um, important uh, issues like uh, the impact of the American Revolution, the impact of the French Revolution, uh, and how that affected uh, politics in Ireland uh, during that period. And of course, how it led to the outbreak of uh, rebellion in 1798, and of course, the uh, Anglo-Irish Union, or the Anglo-British Union, uh, Irish Union of uh, 18. Uh, hundred. So let's begin uh, by providing a uh, or reminding ourselves of a bit of background information uh, about what Ireland uh, was like uh, before uh, 1770. And uh, we have to remember that Ireland, like most other uh, states in Europe in the 18th century, was what is known as a confessional state. In other words, there was a state church and you had to be a member of the state church in order to have full access uh, to political power. Ireland was unique in a European uh, context because the state church, the state church of Ireland, represented only a minority of the population. The overwhelming majority of the population was of course Catholic and they were excluded uh, from full uh, political power uh, and also economic life through a series of penal laws uh, that were passed from the mid 1690s onwards. Presbyterians, uh, the largest Protestant group in the northern province of Ulster, were also not part of the confessional ruling elite because they were the wrong type of uh, Protestant. Presbyterians didn't experience the penal laws in the same ways as Catholics did, but they did um, have their political rights uh, curtailed, uh, most obviously through the so-called sacramental test of uh, 1704. So you had a, a small landowning elite that represented Church of Ireland Protestants who uh, were in control in political power in Ireland during this period. But they also had their own uh, problems to deal with in a political sense because the Irish Parliament that met at Dublin uh, was to all intents and purposes subordinate to the Parliament in London at uh, Westminster and to particularly uh, the, the monarchs uh, Privy Council. So the Irish Parliament couldn't pass legislation by itself, but had to have the prior approval of the monarch's ministers in London. Um, so even the Anglo-Irish elite, if we want to use that term, uh, found that uh, political life wasn't necessarily straightforward. As we get to the middle of the 18th century, um, economic growth begins to affect Ireland in a very significant way. In the early 1740s, Ireland experienced a severe uh, famine, which indicated the fairly precarious nature of the Irish uh, economy. But from the 1750s onwards, the Irish economy begins to grow quite significantly. It's part of a broader growth of what is called the Atlantic economy during this uh, period, and certainly the emigration of uh, tens of thousands of people from Ulster to the colonies in North America uh, reinforced those links. But the main mo driver of economic uh, change in Ulster was, of course, the growth of the linen industry, which particularly affected uh, County Armagh uh, and Southern uh, Ulster. And the consequence of this was that it created wealth. It created a, an urban uh, network. Uh, Belfast, for instance, uh, becomes a, a significant uh, town during this period. But it also potentially disrupts how uh, people have thought about politics uh, and have thought about uh, the status quo. At the same time, there are also changes happening in the world of ideas. This is the age of enlightenment, uh, the age of reason, a reaction against the religious wars and religious fervors of, uh, fervor of the previous uh, century. And ideas of religious toleration are beginning to be discussed uh, by the educated elite and by the middle classes, uh, not only in Ireland, but also throughout Europe. And that those ideas of religious toleration begin to make people question uh, confessional states uh, and the, the relationship between religion and politics. 
And certainly from the, the middle of the 18th century, we're beginning to get movements for political reform um, in Ireland. We've got the development of what is called Anglo-Irish patriotism on the part of members of the Church of Ireland elite, who are becoming more conscious of the subordinate status of the Irish Parliament and are trying to assert uh, the rights of the sister kingdom of Ireland uh, against those of England and Scotland. Uh, so Irish patriotism is beginning to question Anglo-Irish uh, relations and particularly the status of the Irish Parliament. At the same time, you've also got uh, Catholics uh, organising themselves in a political sense. Uh, what eventually becomes the Catholic Committee uh, has its origins in 1757 and then is uh, substantially reorganised in 1760. So you're beginning to get middle class Catholics involved in business and trade who are beginning to agitate um, for um, uh, further rights uh, in, in Ireland and the beginning of the dismantling of the penal laws. So the, there, Ireland is a confessional state where the relationship between religion and politics and power matters a lot. But there are things that are changing in mid 18th century Ireland, which set the background for uh, the period from 1770 onwards. Uh, and the reason why I've begun in uh, 1770 in, is because things are uh, boiling over in terms of relations uh, between uh, Britain and its 13 colonies in uh, North America. Uh, and we're, of course, here thinking what the, the first great democratic revolution um, of, of the period, the American uh, Revolution. And when the American Revolution uh, breaks out, in uh, 1776, it causes widespread consternation uh, amongst the ruling elites in Britain and in Ireland. Um, it's also opposed uh, significantly as well by uh, the uh, leadership of the Catholic uh, Church in Ireland. And one of the, the ways that the rebellion is described in America is the Presbyterian uh, rebellion uh, because of the so-called link between Presbyterians and uh, political radicalism. The, American Revolution has a profound impact upon Ireland in a number of ways. First of all, it uh, leads to uh, an economic uh, recession. So the economic growth that had been occurring all of a sudden is brought to uh, a standstill uh, because of uh, the outbreak of war in America. This is important because it focuses on trade restrictions that are placed on Ireland by Britain, and which of course the Irish Parliament can't do anything about without the prior say so of the, 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 the King's ministers. At the same time, this raises the issue about the status of the Irish Parliament. The American Revolution in many ways is about the, the, the question of representation and sovereignty. Um, the American, uh, uh, those involved in the American Revolution resent the fact that they are being taxed by George III without any say so in that taxation. And for patriots in Ireland, this raises issues about the subordinate status of the Irish uh, Parliament and the extent to which they can pass legislation uh, specifically for Ireland. The revolution also creates uh, military problems as well, uh, particularly in terms of home defence. Uh, many of the regular regiments in the British Army, of course, are sent over uh, to fight uh, the American colonists and their French allies in North America. That potentially leaves Ireland open to potential French invasion. And as a consequence of that, uh, people in Ireland begin to uh, band together to create home defence uh, forces, um, a bit like Dad's army, but uh, <laughs> slightly, slightly different, um, who are eventually called the volunteers. And these volunteers are set up, as I said, primarily uh, or initially in terms of home defence, of defending Ireland from potential French attack. But the volunteers quickly become an incredibly important political organisation. And they lead to, or they begin to uh, uh, get involved in what we might call the politicisation or the political awakening. Um, of uh, various groups in Ireland. Uh, the volunteer quilt, uh, which you can see on the screen, which is held in the National Museums of Northern Ireland uh, in Belfast, is, is a wonderful uh, pictorial representation of the, um, of the, the regularity, of the, uh, the weapons, of the sense of uh, significance uh, 
of the volunteer companies. By the time uh, we get to the spring 1779, there are 12,000 uh, members of these volunteer companies. By the time they get to May 1782, there are 60,000 men who are involved in volunteer companies who are dressed in uniforms, who have, uh, uh, who have arms and are not just defending Ireland from potential French attack, but are also getting involved in political questions. And in the province of Ulster in particular, the volunteers are particularly important for Presbyterians um, who have found themselves excluded uh, from full access to the Protestant uh, confessional state and who have found themselves gaining money uh, and wealth and influence uh, through the economic uh, boom from the 1750s onwards, but who find that they can't uh, uh, translate that economic power into political power. And what the volunteers become for Presbyterians is a way to begin to think about politics and a way to think about how they might potentially use their numbers to bring about political change. And certainly the, in terms of the Presbyterian ministers who are preaching sermons to these volunteer uh, companies, there's a very strong sense that the volunteers are citizen soldiers who are standing up for liberty and are standing up for political reform. And the high point of this uh, process of political reform uh, occurs on the 15th of February 1782 when the volunteers have a national convention in uh, Dungannon uh, of, of all places. And they argue, or uh, at the Dungannon convention, they argue that the Irish Parliament should be given the right to pass legislation uh, as soon as possible, that there should be political reform uh, in general in terms of how politics in Ireland works. And there's also the beginning of an attempt to say, actually politics in Ireland shouldn't just be about Church of Ireland Protestants and Presbyterians, but it could also potentially include the Catholic majority as well. And some of the more radical, uh, politically radical companies of volunteers uh, in the early 1780s begin to admit Catholics uh, to uh, their companies and begin to think about um, putting pressure on the government to grant further political rights to Catholics. The upshot of all this political pressure is that the British government, um, who are involved in a, a war that they are losing in North America are put under huge pressure by 60,000 armed uh, people in Ireland who are demanding political reform. And as a consequence of the, the pressure that the uh, volunteers uh, bring to bear, in 1779, uh, the British uh, Parliament gets rid of many of the tr uh, trade restrictions that they have placed upon Irish uh, trade. And in 1782, they grant legislative independence to the Dublin Parliament. Uh, the Dublin Parliament from then, many of you may know, is known as Grattan's Parliament, named after the great uh, patriot uh, leader, Henry uh, Grattan. So from 1782 onwards, the Irish Parliament now has the ability to pass legislation by itself without the prior approval uh, of the monarch's uh, uh, Privy Council in England. What also happens uh, in the midst of the pressures of the uh, American uh, war is that the penal laws against Irish Catholics begin to be dismantled. Uh, those affecting uh, uh, public worship, those affecting uh, land uh, ownership begin to be dismantled during this period. And there's a very strategic reason why uh, the, the British state and the Irish Parliament is, 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 is doing this. And that's because the, the manpower needs of the British Army are, are becoming acute. And it is hoped by the British state that by granting concessions uh, to Catholics, by getting rid of the penal laws, that will boost Catholic recruitment to uh, the British Army. And of course, the upshot of this is that whenever uh, the Duke of Wellington, that other uh, well-known Irishman, takes the field at Waterloo in 1815, about 40 percent of his army is made up of Irish Catholic uh, soldiers. At the same time, the uh, sacramental test, which I mentioned, which particularly affected Presbyterians, um, is also quietly removed from the statute book in 1780, and Presbyterians can then uh, vote in particular elections and stand for borough constituencies. So the, the volunteers, which began as a home defence organisation, um, have been able to use people power uh, 
uh, if that's the, the term uh, we think is appropriate, to put pressure on the government to grant uh, concessions. That is the high point of volunteer uh, political influence in uh, 1782. After 1782-83, um, political reform becomes more difficult to achieve. The Irish Parliament has received, uh, has, has got its legislative independence, but the Irish Parliament is still dominated by the Church of Ireland landed elite. And a new term is coined at this, at this time to describe uh, that group. They're known as the Protestant Ascendancy. Uh, the ascendancy of Church of Ireland Protestants. And they uh, jealously guard their newfound um, uh, power in, uh, the, uh, in the Irish Parliament and are very reluctant to grant further political reforms. So what you get then are Presbyterian middle-class reformers and Catholic middle-class reformers who are feeling incredibly frustrated that they've been they've been involved in this process of politicisation, but the wagons are being circled uh, by the Protestant ascendancy, and they're becoming increasingly frustrated that uh, further political reform will not be uh, granted. So there's a lingering sense of frustration uh, amongst both Catholics and uh, Presbyterians in Ireland uh, from the early 1780s onwards. That sense of frustration is alleviated uh, somewhat when the second great uh, uh, democratic revolution uh, of the period occurs, of course, we mean uh, the French Revolution of uh, 1789. And I suppose uh, we should begin by noting that, generally speaking, across the, the, the political spectrum in Britain and Ireland to some degree, the French Revolution is welcomed uh, because it's always fun, uh, particularly in Britain, to see your uh, traditional enemy uh, suffering internal uh, problems. There's also a sense as well in the early days of the French Revolution that it will go the same way as the so-called Glorious Revolution went in England, not necessarily in Ireland, of course. Uh, the Glorious Revolution in England was largely, largely bloodless and led to a seemingly smooth transition of power from Catholic James II uh, to the Protestant uh, William and Mary. For uh, political those who want political reform in Ireland, the ideas of the French Revolution of liberty, equality uh, and fraternity or brotherhood are incredibly uh, powerful. The French Revolution, of course, also raises issues about national identity. Uh, and many modern scholars, of course, see the French Revolution as the beginning of modern uh, nationalism. So there's a great sense of excitement uh, around what's happening in France, a, a, a potential that people power in France has overthrown the old regime and the potential that people power in Ireland could also bring about significant political change as well. For religiously minded uh, Protestants in, in Ulster as well, the French Revolution is also greeted with great enthusiasm uh, because for many Protestants who read their Bibles, it seems that what is happening in France is, has already been predicted in the last book of the Bible, uh, the book of Revelation. France is the great Catholic power in Europe. And for Protestants reading their Bible, they see the, the fall of Catholic France as a, a sign that the age-old enemy of the papacy is at an end that God is doing something new, that there is going to be a new age where Protestantism is going to sweep the globe uh, and is going to um, uh, convert uh, the world. So that, that sense of excitement, of millennial excitement, if you like, is particularly important for uh, Presbyterians in Ulster. And it affects not just um, conservative-minded Presbyterians, uh, but also liberal-minded Presbyterians uh, as well. So the French Revolution, certainly up until um, uh, 1792, is a remarkably positive uh, thing uh, for political reformers in Ireland. As with most revolutions, however, the revolution doesn't stay the same thing in uh, France. And uh, after uh, 17, late 1792, the course that the French Revolution takes makes many people who were initially supportive of the revolution much more wary uh, about uh, events in France. The introduction of Madame Guillotine, uh, the terror against supporters of the old uh, regime, uh, turns uh, opinion 
uh, particularly conservative opinion in Britain and Ireland. And certainly after war is declared between uh, Britain and revolutionary France in January 1793, it is much, much more difficult to be pro-French uh, in Ireland and in Britain uh, because you're supporting the enemy uh, that your uh, estate is fighting against. So the French Revolution is very important in terms of um, fanning the embers of uh, political reformers in Ireland. But we're already beginning to see the French Revolution itself changes uh, over time. But certainly the French Revolution is important for uh, political reformers and radicals in uh, the north of Ireland. And it's particularly important for Presbyterians, for those political and religious reasons uh, that I was uh, mentioning. It's particularly important for Presbyterians because as my uh, undergraduate students uh, find out to their cost when they take my uh, courses, that the, the founders, uh, in many, arguably of modern Irish Republicanism, were actually Presbyterians in the Northeast, who of course, by the time we get to the Home Rule crises in the 1880s, are very much uh, supportive of the, uh, the Union and the connection with Great Britain. And the historians often only talk about Presbyterians in Ireland because of that interesting political transformation or trajectory uh, from United Irishmen in the 1790s to Unionists in the 1880s. But there are very obvious reasons why Presbyterians would support political reform and radical political reform in the early 1790s. They've been excluded uh, from full access to political power. They are making money in terms of the economy, but aren't able to get involved in the political uh, process. And so as a consequence of their social and economic position, Presbyterians have a long-standing support for political reform in 18th century Ireland. And uh, in the aftermath of the French Revolution, the volunteers in Ulster are revived again, and Presbyterians are very much at the forefront of that movement. A key figure in this is a uh, uh, the Presbyterian physician, uh, William uh, Drennan, uh, who, um, whose archive uh, you can see in, in the Public Record, Record Office of Northern Ireland and has been uh, wonderfully edited by Jean Agnew. But what William Drennan does is he comes up with the idea of a secret oath-bound society to advocate for political reform, radical political reform in Ireland. William Drennan was the son of a Presbyterian minister he was deeply influenced by the Enlightenment. Uh, a father, uh, so, uh, sorry, a friend of his father uh, was the great Scottish, or the great uh, figure of the Scottish Enlightenment, Francis Hutchison uh, from Saintfield uh, in County Down. And Drennan himself was very involved in the Volunteers. And in a series of letters to his brother-in-law, Samuel McTeer, he begins to formulate what becomes the Society of United Irishmen. And when the Society of United Irishmen meets in Belfast for the first time on the 18th of October 1791, all but one of the original members of the Society are Presbyterians. The only non-Presbyterian is Wolf Tone, um, who was a Church of Ireland uh, Protestant. Now the Society of United Irishmen, when it is set up in October 1791, has three main aims, uh, which you can see on the slide. Uh, the first is to bring about union between all the people of Ireland, um, Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. In other words, trying to argue that a person's per, uh, professed religion should not determine their access uh, to politics. They also advocate, secondly, for parliamentary reform, which actually properly represents uh, the, the true uh, population and demographic of Ireland. And thirdly, of course, associated with that, there should be full and immediate Catholic emancipation. Catholics should have the right to vote and to sit in Parliament. Now, the, the key point here, of course, is that this is a, there's nothing here about separation uh, from Britain at this point. There's nothing here about violent revolution. There were people within the United Irishmen who were thinking about that at this stage, but that wasn't the avowed uh, position of the United Irishmen in uh, 1791. And for the first few years of their existence, the Society of United Irishmen, particularly in Ulster, was largely a middle class uh, pressure group trying to put pressure on uh, Parliament to bring about radical political uh, reform. 
So Northern Presbyterians are very much at the forefront of thinking about radical political reform at this point. At the same time, there are also developments amongst Irish Catholics as well. The Catholic Committee, which I mentioned earlier on, which was originally set up in 1760, becomes a much more radical political organization in, uh, in 1791, um, um, which actually forces out of the organization those um, who are more conservatively uh, minded. One of the, uh, the symbols of the um, more radical uh, direction of the Catholic Committee is the appointment of United Irishmen to important positions within the organisation, including Wolf Tone, who himself is made Secretary of the Catholic Committee in 1792. Wolf Tone um, in 1791 um, writes um, the, uh, the pamphlet, which is on the screen, an argument on behalf of the Catholics of Ireland, uh, which is aimed specifically at Northern Presbyterians. And as you can see from the, the title page of the pamphlet in front of you, uh, this uh, particular version was reprinted by order of the Belfast Society of United Irishmen. So Tone is trying through this pamphlet to appeal specifically to Northern Presbyterians to get them to support uh, Catholic uh, emanci emancipation. The Catholic Committee organises a Catholic convention in December 1792, where delegates are uh, uh, elected to that convention based upon a, a, a countrywide ballot. And in many ways, the Catholic Convention of 1792 is much, much more representative of Irish, uh, the Irish population than the Dublin uh, Parliament is. Because of the, the pressure of, that's being brought to bear on government in 1793, the Catholic Relief Act is passed, which allows Catholics the right to vote in elections and opens up most uh, senior offices, uh, political offices to Catholics. It's accompanied at the same time by a, a militia act, uh, which is badly handled by the government. Uh, and it uh, puts um, a, a significant amount of uh, pressure on uh, Catholics to join compulsory the militia. Eventually that provision is got rid of. So Catholics have been able through the Catholic Committee to put pressure on government to bring about Catholic relief. And when the new uh, Viceroy or Lord Lieutenant is appointed in 1795, Earl Fitzwilliam, there is the hope that he will come with the express aim of getting rid of the last of the penal laws against Irish Catholics, particularly their right to sit in Parliament. Unfortunately, that is uh, so badly handled that Fitzwilliam leaves uh, Ireland, is recalled from Ireland uh, very quickly. And it seems to many uh, in the Catholic Committee and also in the United Irishmen that the possibility of achieving political reform through political processes has been dealt a serious and a fatal blow. Below the level of, of largely middle class uh, Catholic Ireland, we also, of course, have a popular Catholic disaffection, which is beginning to express itself at this period uh, through an organisation that is known as uh, the Defenders. And mention of the Defenders brings us back to uh, where our virtual location is uh, this evening uh, to uh, County Armagh, because the Defenders um, arose um, as a Catholic oath-bound secret society in response to the aggression of Protestants in uh, County Armagh. And sort of sectarian tensions between lower class Catholics and Protestants had been bubbling under the surface for some time in County Armagh and in the mid 1780s it uh, breaks out uh, into faction fights between the Protestant People Day Boys and the Catholic uh, defenders. The, they're called the People Day Boys because one of the things they did was they raided uh, Catholic homes at the peep of day, the, the, the break of day, in order to confiscate any arms uh, that might be held by Catholics. The bearing of arms, of course, is a great symbol of uh, citizenship uh, in this period. Uh, and the idea that Catholics could bear arms was an affront to uh, how Protestants understood uh, citizenship and involvement in the political process. In the late uh, 1780s, uh, the, uh, there's an intensification of, the, uh, uh, of these 
tensions between Protestant people, day boys and Catholic defenders. There are arms raids on each other's uh, homes. There are faction fights uh, at local markets and fairs. And there are also public processions um, against each other uh, in, uh, in public uh, spaces. The high point, or I suppose one of the most notorious uh, clashes uh, between uh, Catholics uh, and Protestants is, of course, the, the, the Battle of the Diamond on the 21st of September 1795, which, of course, gives uh, a, a, the origin to what is known originally as the Orange Society and later on uh, the Orange Order. So County Armagh is becoming associated uh, with uh, sectarian uh, tensions and sectarian uh, troubles. And in late 1795, uh, there is um, occurs what is known as the Armagh Outrages, when over 7,000 Catholics, it is estimated, are driven from their homes in uh, County Armagh. And I'll just uh, read a, a quote, a quotation here from the Earl of Gosford, uh, who in a, in a private letter uh, to a friend of his, talks about these Armagh Outrages, and it gives you a sense of what was happening, and I quote, It is no secret that a persecution is now raging in this county. Neither age nor sex is sufficient to excite mercy, much less to afford protection. The only crime which the wretched objects of this ruthless persecution are charged with is a crime of easy proof. It is simply a profession of the Roman Catholic faith. A lawless bandity have constituted themselves judges of this new species of delinquency, and the sentence they have denounced is equally concise and terrible. It is nothing less than a confiscation of all property and an immediate banishment. And it's certainly the case that the sectarian tensions that occur in County Armagh uh, in the early, um, 17, early to mid 1790s very much contribute uh, to the bitterness of the 1798 rebellion when it breaks out. But how do we actually explain why these uh, troubles break out, these sectarian tensions break out in County Armagh uh, during this uh, period. Um, historians um, have uh, been debating this issue uh, since at least uh, the 1960s, and there, there are three uh, potential areas or explanations uh, we can uh, think of. The first has to do with the geography of County Armagh itself. Uh, County Armagh was the most densely populated uh, county in Ireland, uh, at this period, largely due to the uh, linen industry. It was also a county that was fairly equally divided between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, so it wasn't a Catholic majority or Protestant majority, uh, but uh, the, the relationship was much more equal. County Armagh itself was divided roughly into three zones. Uh, and, uh, the Church of Ireland dominated north, a more Presbyterian middle, and a predominantly Catholic uh, south. So historians have argued that there's just something about the way the county is organised and its religious demography, uh, which um, feeds into these troubles. The second explanation which historians have focused on is uh, economic growth and particularly the impact of the linen industry. And what the linen industry in particular does is it raises the status, the economic status of Catholics and allows Catholics to enter into land, uh, the competition for land uh, to rent from uh, uh, landlords. The consequence of this, of course, is that the Protestants who have been doing economically very well, all of a sudden are now faced with Catholics who are doing very well from uh, the economic system. And there's the status of Protestants as a consequence is being undermined. At the same time, economic growth is also leading to the decline of deference towards traditional authorities and also uh, the breakdown in many cases as well of familial control. So the economic growth of the, the time is disrupting traditional uh, relationships. It's raising the status of Catholics and that is uh, uh, making uh, plebeian Protestants particularly uh, worried. There is, of course, also the broader political context as well, which is feeding into this. Uh, the radicalisation of the Catholic question in the early 1790s uh, leads to a greater um, uh, politi political involvement. Uh, the, the volunteers are replaced in 1793 uh, by the militia, and the impact that has on Catholic-Protestant relations is also uh, significant as well. But I suppose that the, the thing in terms of the, the landowning elite within County Armagh is that there's a backlash 
against uh, these uh, attempts to try and increase the status uh, and political involvement of uh, Catholics. So it depends, I suppose, on, on which particular offence uh, or which particular side of the fence you want to, to, to sit on in terms of these explanations. But I think all of these explanations, uh, to some degree, uh, begin to help us to think uh, about why it was that Armagh uh, was the, the, the centre for this type of uh, conflict. So we're now in the mid uh, 1790s and something incredibly important happens in terms of the Society of United Irishmen. The Society of United Irishmen in 1795 adopts a new constitution, a new set of aims and objectives. The, essentially what happens is that the Society of United Irishmen in 1795 becomes a revolutionary conspiracy uh, whose aim is to uh, establish an independent Irish Republic with the help of revolutionary France. So any pretense that there was before, if we can describe it as pretense about uh, promoting political reform through political means, has been got rid of by the adoption of this new constitution. And of course, the background to this is, is quite obvious. Um, frustrated political reform, the failure of Fitzwilliam to introduce uh, even more um, uh, uh, um, Catholic uh, relief. The European war is, uh, is in the background and is causing all sorts of stresses and strains uh, within society. And as a consequence of that, the government, the state, is beginning to uh, put its foot down on potential uh, rebels and potential revolutionary activity. So from that perspective, the transformation of the Society of United Irishmen isn't a particularly um, um, uh, unsurprising uh, uh, step that is taken. Links are made uh, with revolutionary France and in 1796 a French invasion force is actually sent to Ireland uh, to uh, uh, bring about a uh, rebellion. There's a storm and the French fleet is largely dispersed though some uh, French soldiers are able to land at Bantry Bay uh, on the south coast of the island. Nevertheless the United Irishmen despite that setback continue to grow in numbers. And it's estimated by the time we get to February 1798, that well over uh, 280,000 people in Ireland have taken the oath of the Society of United Irishmen. By any standard, that is a remarkable level of politicization and engagement with a secret uh, revolutionary uh, society. But with the growth in numbers come significant tensions within the United Irish movement itself uh, between middle class enlightenment reformers in Dublin and Belfast and more uh, sectarian um, and motivated uh, uh, people in, uh, in southern Ulster and south and west of Ireland. There's a big difference between those in the east of the country where agriculture and society is a bit more commercialised and those in the west who have maybe more uh, agrarian grievances. There are tensions between Catholic defenders and Presbyterian United Irishmen in the North and East who think that there's going to be a Presbyterian millennium which they will be fighting to be involved in. So I suppose the key, one of the key things about creating this mass-based revolutionary conspiracy is you need to appeal to as broad a constituency as possible. But by doing so, you're bringing together into a coalition potentially um, disparate uh, and divergent uh, groups. Um, and the United Irishmen know this themselves. Uh, so some of the, uh, the evidence that we have for Ulster shows that in Protestant areas, uh, uh, United Irishmen are involved in, uh, in uh, publishing anti-Catholic material. And in Catholic areas, they're publishing anti-Protestant material in order to gain uh, recruits to the United Irishmen. Part, the, 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 the heterogeneous character of the United Irishmen is perhaps part of the reason why when the rebellion breaks out in 1798, um, it is uh, a bit of a damp squib and is actually in many ways uh, a disaster. Uh, the rebellion doesn't break out in areas where the United, doesn't begin in an area where the United Irishmen were strong. It actually begins in County Wexford. The rebellion in Ulster, where the United Irishmen were strong, um, is hamstrung by internal disagreements. And when the rebellion breaks out in early June, there are uh, there is a battle at Balnahinch at Antrim and skirmishes elsewhere, 
but the rebellion is quickly uh, put uh, down. So the 1798 rebellion is is a bloody thing, but it's estimated about 60,000 uh, people in Ireland die as a consequence of the rebellion and the brutal suppression of the rebellion as well uh, by government forces um, leaves Ireland stunned uh, in terms of what uh, to do uh, next. Historians have focused a lot on 1798 and the United Irishmen. It's only in, in relatively recent years that historians have actually begun to spend a lot of time or spend some time uh, thinking about those who actually opposed uh, the rebellion in Ireland. And um, historians such as Tom Bartlett, Alan Blackstock and others have looked at the forces of defence and counterinsurgency. And one of the points that was brought out in that literature is that those crown forces, uh, to use that uh, phrase, included Catholics and Protestants. The Irish militia, uh, which is set up in 1793, uh, was staffed uh, at an officer level by Protestants, but was made up largely by Catholics. And whenever the rebellion breaks out, you have this situation where you have, in some areas, uh, Catholic militiamen fighting against Protestant United Irishmen. Um, and that's led some to characterise the 1798 rebellion as almost a civil war uh, within Ireland. Um, there's been focus, particularly by Tom Bartlett and others, on those spies and informers within the United Irishmen um, who were actually telling the state about uh, the uh, internal affairs of the organisation. Certainly all of the churches in Ireland are very much against uh, the uh, rebellion of uh, 1798 and are against more generally uh, radical political reform and republicanism. The Catholic Church in particular, the leadership of the Catholic Church in particular, has a real juggling act uh, to, uh, to manage the tension between many of its flock who are supporting radical political reform and republicanism and the, the fear that the French disease of republicanism is actually going to overthrow their own church in Ireland. And as a consequence, the Catholic bishops are incredibly worried uh, about uh, radicalism and are incredibly worried about how that might undermine their own authority and position. All the Presbyterian churches uh, quickly issue uh, statements of loyalty uh, to uh, the state and the, the British connection in uh, 1798. Presbyterians don't stop being political reformers. Uh, Presbyterians are still very much committed to political reform. Uh, but the point is that though there are Presbyterians who are very involved in radicalism, that does not mean that all Presbyterians are radical. Uh, Ian McBride's work has shown that um, it's estimated that 63 Presbyterian ministers were uh, potentially implicated in the rebellion of 1798. Uh, but the point that McBride makes is that 60, implication doesn't equal guilt. Uh, and it may well be a reflect, reflection of the fact that Presbyterians were seen as naturally rebellious, um, largely due to memories of the uh, 17th uh, century. We, we also are beginning to get some uh, better information about the early origins of popular Protestant loyalism, and particularly the Orange Order, uh, but it's still one of the most remarkable uh, facts, I think, in uh, about modern Irish history, that we know more about the Orange Order in Canada uh, than we do about the Orange Order in Ireland. Uh, and certainly if there's any potential PhD students out there who want to work on the history of the Orange Order, uh, please do chat to me uh, about that. So I think it's, it's important to emphasise that the uh, 1790s are about revolutionaries and are about rebels, but they're also about those who oppose revolution and rebellion as well. And they get less uh, attention uh, from uh, scholars. Of course, the 1798 rebellion uh, leads to the, uh, in many ways, to the Act of Union of 1800, when the Irish Parliament uh, votes itself uh, out of existence and a new imperial parliament, as it's called, uh, of uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland is established at uh, Westminster. Now, it's, I, I devote two lectures to talking about the Anglo-Irish uh, Union in my level two course at Queen's, so you'll be glad to know I won't be speaking for two hours on this particular topic. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the reasons that historians uh, and scholars have put forward for why the Union of 1800 uh, came about. 
a more traditional uh, view was that the union was simply a response uh, or a, a product of British hostility towards Ireland and the use of corruption on an unprecedented scale. And um, certainly recent research uh, in the last 20 years has shown that there was a significant amount of secret service money uh, that was used to ensure that a pro-union majority uh, was returned in uh, the Irish, uh, 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 Irish uh, Parliament. But others have be, have suggested that maybe the longer term um, uh, origins of the union have to do with the fact that an independent Irish parliament was incompatible with the security of the, the British state. And it's interesting that from the 1750s, 1760s onwards, British public opinion, certainly at an elite level, is beginning to think about parliamentary union as a way to secure Ireland against French attack at precisely the time when public opinion in Ireland is moving away uh, from uh, union. Uh, and certainly from 1760s, 1770s onwards, British uh, elite public opinion is becoming more amenable to the idea of a parliamentary union. The uh, legislative independence that's granted in 1782 to the Dublin uh, Parliament uh, is great for the Dublin Parliament in terms of the power that it gets, but it dis dismantles existing political relationships between Britain uh, and Ireland without putting anything in its place. And there are a whole series of uh, constitutional problems and tensions between Britain and Ireland as a consequence of 1782. So British statesmen are beginning to think that getting rid of the, the Dublin Parliament and having a central parliament in Westminster would be much more uh, productive of good uh, government. And we can't also, we also can't discount the stress and strain of leadership in a period of war and uh, rebellion. Um, one of the, the questions I get my, my students to think about is the timing of unions. Uh, the 1707 Anglo-Scottish uh, Union, for instance, uh, was passed during a period of uh, European war uh, between Britain and France and the need uh, for the British uh, state and the English state to ensure that it had enough resources to fight against uh, France. It's the same thing that is occurring in the 1790s. The war against France isn't going particularly well at this point. Um, uh, Britain feels that Ireland is a potential stepping stone for a French invasion. The abortive French invasion at, at Bantry Bay in 1796 raises those big questions uh, about the security of Britain and of Ireland. So a balance between long-term trends and short-term triggers and turning points, I think is where the consensus amongst historians is now in terms of the Act of Union. What broader reflections can we uh, uh, make in terms of thinking about this uh, period? The, the first point I would make is that there were a variety of responses to the age of revolutions from different groups for different reasons at different times. Um, one of the great things about historical study is that we look at change over time and how people's opinions and views and attitudes can change in response to specific events. And I think that's incredibly important in terms of thinking uh, about what's happening in late 18th century Ireland. I think we could also ask questions about whether the age of revolutions creates a new or consolidates existing radicalism in Ireland. Um, there is an argument to say that what happens in the late 18th century is a, a blip or is a very odd moment in terms of the relationship between Britain and Ireland, which quickly uh, disappears because it's remarkable how politics returns in many ways to old fashioned ways uh, of landlord influence in the immediate aftermath of the um, Act of Union. I think it's also important to underline the point that 1790s in particular is a period of, of revolution, absolutely, but it's also an important period of counter-revolution, or as I've said erroneously on my screen, counter-counter uh, revolution groups. Uh, apologies for that, it must be a Freudian slip of some uh, kind. Uh, but I, I suppose it's, it's a plea to take seriously uh, not just the revolutionaries uh, who are involved, but also those who opposed uh, revolution. And uh, counterfactual history is not a particularly um, uh, 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 positive, uh, hasn't a particularly positive press amongst professional historians. Uh, but one thing you might like to consider is if the 1798 rebellion had been successful, uh, what type of Ireland would have been created in the aftermath? Would the United Irishmen themselves have remained united with those different 
conflicting uh, factions and groups uh, within it.